Welcome to a recent release roundup for March books in 2023. If you're new to this video series, I'll have a playlist down below. I will have a Goodreads shelf with all of the books that I'm going to talk about in this video and all of the review videos that I watch to prepare all of the thoughts because this is just me trying to compile an aggregate of currently right now what's the buzz around these new releases to try and help you and me get a better sense of what I should be picking up, what I should skip, things like that because now these books are out. Now people have opinions. We're not just, you know, attracted to the shiny covers, although I'm still attracted to many shiny covers. Um, I had read a lot of the March releases I wanted to read, but there were still a few novellas I didn't get to. And then, per usual, when doing research for this, there's like a few other books. I'm just like, oh, I should try that out. And it's like time. Time is so finite. <laughs> but March, I knew, was a big month for me when I first saw a lot of the anticipated releases videos. So I'm glad I at least read a lot of what I wanted to. So we're going to start with novellas and then just go into some novels and no real sense of order. Um, first one being The Mimicking of Known Successes by Malka Older, who I've read the entire Infomocracy trilogy by. Wonderful trilogy. I do have a Should You Read. Incredibly unique. If you want something unique, want a different government system to explore, check out that review, check out that series. But this is the beginning of a novella series, and I was interested because there were things I really liked about Infomocracy and things that I didn't like, so I was curious how this would work. And I do have reviews by Rachel from Shades of Orange, um, Barkhart Bookshelf, which is a channel that does a lot of reviews for recent releases and stuff like that. So if you want someone who's reading new things, definitely that channel, and also pairs a book with a drink that matches it which I think is a really fun, unique idea. And then Shannon from That So Poe has a dedicated standalone review. And I was really interested in Shannon's take because Shannon and I buddy read Infomocracy. And some things we both liked, some things we, you know, we had, you know, when you read with a friend, some things you agree on and some things you don't. So I was curious what her take on this would be. And this is a Sherlock Holmesian mystery. I don't really know what that means because I've only ever watched Sherlock Holmes things. But I assume that means you have a detective and a partner and they're working together to solve a mystery and maybe it's more deductive. But I personally, when people were talking about that, don't have a strong sense of what that means. But what had me both interested and hesitant, but at least frames it in a way that I think I'll have the right expectations is Shannon compared to this to cozy mysteries, especially because this takes place in a far off future where we have colonized a moon of Jupiter. And but still, there aren't that many people here. So it has this small town vibe. So it's got small town vibes. We have a mystery to solve. We have really competent characters, which I'm very familiar with that from the Infomocracy series, which is always interesting. And then there's a second chance sapphic romance, which is apparently done in a really adult, mature and slow burn way. So I feel like my expectations are set. And I do remember what Malka Older did with her romances in Infomocracy. So I think it's probably going to be similar to stuff that I'm used to. So I'm still interested in this. I'm nervous because it's mystery focused and mystery focused things are not always my thing. But in a novella form that worked better for me from um, a novella last year, even though I knew the end. So a better chance than when I'm reading long form things. So still on my radar. It was definitely one I wanted to check out because just Malka Older's world building. And that's something I got from reviews as well. It's just like it truly felt like this is what a colony might look like on a, you know, a moon of Jupiter. So that's just cool within itself. The next one we'll talk about is The Lies of a Jungo. And so this is a new novella set, I believe, in an African inspired fantasy space. I have reviews from Shannon, Less Than 3D, Jashana, Bethany at Beautifully Bookish Bethany, and Rachel again from Shades of Orange. Just general shout out that Rachel from the Shades of Orange is prevalently appearing on all these lists. Apparently she read a lot of the books I was interested in in March, which is very useful to me because I have a pretty good sense of when our tastes align and don't align. So great for me. Amazing booktuber. Highly recommend you check her out if you somehow haven't already. And so something all of the reviewers said was the word fable. So if you want a mythological fable, kind of, I think, I don't know if it's coming of age is the right word, but it's a journey story, both in the sense that this character is going on a physical journey, but it felt like also there's a potential emotional journey of our character. Grows up in this world where there's not a lot of water. Water is very scarce and then people lose their, or have their tongues taken away for reasons I'm unclear of, but they are going on this quest to, I believe, find water or find something to help their community. And that's what they're doing. I don't have much more than that. So in general, when things didn't work for Shannon, it was a little too fast paced for her and her tastes and a little too graphic at times. So if you align with Shannon's taste, that's what you can know from there. And in general, I think, oddly enough, I think Jashana gave it the highest rating. And then Bethany and Rachel were more closer to each other were they kind of wanted more. I personally wonder how a fable will work for me in a novella form, because I think I like fables more in like a short story 
space because sometimes if you get a little too long then you kind of wish you did have more meat to like sink into because fables can be very um not surface level like there's a lot to unpack in a fable but sometimes you don't get that character depth or connection and i wonder if that's the thing that was missing but you generally get to be as ignorant as the main character and this is what i got from people which can make you know discovery of this new world really fun in a novella setting so I'm curious about it. If it gets nominated for a bunch of stuff next year, I'll, I'll definitely check it out. I'm not sure if this was enough to make me want to pick it up. It was like on my radar, but not like on my I should pick it up radar because quests are just not, not my thing. Very few quests make it. Although it did remind me a little bit in Synopsis talk of Each of Us a Desert, but Each of Us a Desert is not a fable. But like that's like one of the few questing stories that works for me. The last novella we have is Feed Them Silence by Lee Mandelo. And this is an author I've read from before. I've read Summer Suns loved it, was very eager to see what else they put out next. And so this is the new one. It's a very short novella. I think it's done by Tor's um, horror line, although I think reviews are mixed on if it's actually a horror or if it's just more be more unsettling. It depends on your definition of horror. But I have reviews from Rachel Shades of Orange, Tina Sound and Fury, Barcard Bookshelf, and Bethany from Beautifully Bookish Bethany. And yeah, this story seems to stick with people. Even though it's a really small package, even Rachel said that it was an appropriate size for her. Like, she talked about this and the lies of a Jungo in the same rap up video and where as the latter didn't work for her as well because she wanted more space this one felt like it was the right size for what was being portrayed something that i feel like everyone should know is that this has an unlikable protagonist she is a very committed scientist but a lot of people said that even though she's meant to be unlikable she's meant to be abrasive and she's definitely making relationship choices that are not good for a healthy relationship it's realistic it's grounded in reality in a way that i think makes it more palatable. It's not this over-the-top unlikable protagonist. It's just a very unlikable protagonist who is a little too obsessed with her work. Um, and the story, I think everyone is trying to be vague because, you know, it's really short, but it seems to be that her work is to connect people to the thought processes and experiences of animals, specifically this last surviving wolf, I think with the wolf's on the cover. And it's that work that she becomes obsessed with. And so we look at that in the empathy with animals, and I think also her relationship with her partner who is also a scientist and it's a sapphic relationship as well if you were looking for that representation so yeah i this is one i've wanted to read i still want to read it um <laughs> even though like i feel like i have very little to go on but i mean i tend to like unlikable protagonists for the most part it depends if they're competent and unlikable i think i like them more when they're not competent I don't know why. It's probably something else that I should unpack at one point in my life or another. But yeah, that was a novella. I went into this series being like, I still want to read this. And I still do because so many people had a good time with it. Even people who normally aren't novella people are having a good time with it. Like that says a lot. Into our novels, we have The Foxglove King, which I didn't even know was coming out. I didn't even know it was hyped, but I found a lot of review videos for this. So we have Bethany who DNF'd it. We have Booked Panda. We have Brighton Bookish. We have Cassidy Washburn with a YouTube short. We have Book Dragon Reviews, who's a very, very, very new channel. Highly recommend you go check them out. Give them a subscribe. Like we're talking single digit subscribers, new channel. Um, Michaela Love and Monica the Bibliophilist. So those are all the reviews I could find. So this is, I didn't know this until I was looking it up, the author of Who Wrote For the Wolf, which is, I believe, a story that people comp a lot to Uprooted and it had a sequel or something like that. And so this is that author and this is supposed to be a fantasy romance, but everyone said that if you went into this wanting your fantasy romance with the spicy fan like romance part of it, no, it's more of a fantasy that definitely has romance. There's a love triangle. So if you don't like love triangles, there's a love triangle. And so there's definitely tension in the will they won't they with characters, but it's not, if you're here for a romantic part of a rom fantasy romance, this isn't going to be the book for you. Now, a lot of people loved the world building. So for a bunch of people, the fantasy world was really interesting. I was trying to understand it. It doesn't feel too different from things I've read before, but if you like necromancy and if you like, you know, the, the you know, religion versus government and magic, like that seems to be this whole thing with the magic, like magic is tied to gods and there used to be many gods, but now there's only one God and maybe an asleep God. And that, yeah, I was pretty confused. I watched a lot of videos. So I think that's something that would make more sense to me if I read it. So there's a lot to unpack there. And then there is the idea of who writes history, what part of history is true, because we have this family that's been ruling for 300 years. And so obviously they have a say in what gets written in texts. And our main character is someone who has abilities that she should not have. So she's hiding it. She works with smugglers until she's caught by the kingdom and then told by the kingdom to spy on the prince, who is one of the love interests. And that's the setup, I think, 
for the plot. Not everyone loved it. Some people, I think, had some pacing issues, and some people really loved the end, while some people didn't. I know Bethany DNF'd it just because she wasn't getting on with it. She tried, and I think she had decided that this author is just not the fit for her. But in general, most people who loved it loved it because it was the perfect brain candy for them. It was a fun, plot-driven fantasy time, and that's what they wanted, and that's what they got. So if you're ever in the mood for that, this is a new adult fantasy book. I think that's another thing. It's like general consensus, especially from people who didn't know if this was marketed as adult or young adult, were just picking it up and reading it, is that it's definitely in that new adult space. Like if you're familiar with young adult and you're looking for a bridge book, this is probably really good. Um, but if you read a lot of adult, I don't necessarily know if this is going to leave like live up to a lot of your expectations and what you generally read in adult. I have no clue. And again, there's a love triangle. So for those of you who hate, despise, cannot handle a love triangle, maybe steer clear. <laughs> Another book that came out, and I don't actually know if this is for adults or young adults. I think based off reviews, it's probably more for adults, maybe new adult. This is Bitter Medicine. This is one that was not on my radar and I now need it. <laughs> I really, really want to read it, which is funny because a lot of people had that have similar reading tastes to me have had not a good time. But then there was one review that I was like, oh, I need this. And that was um, Always Doing. Always Doing's review, I was like, oh, I need this book. <laughs> but I also have reviews from Monica the Bibliophist, Bethany who DNF'd it. And I have one from Rachel from Shades of Orange. And so this is a contemporary urban fantasy romance. It's like a 50% fantasy, 50% romance, and it's like slow burn. I got a lot of cute, sweet, if you like legends and lattes, you know, I got a lot of that energy, a really, really well realized world that you're just dropped into and you just get trusted to learn about it as you go. Um, quick, snappy writing from a debut author. And I don't know, it just felt like it was going to be one of those slow, quiet tales that I would be completely like caught up in if I loved the writing style and the characters. Like one of those books I couldn't put down, not because it was plot driven, but because I was so invested. I don't know why that's what I think, but it's what I really want. So yeah, um, I will say something someone brought up is that there are gory fight scenes. And that was one of the things that they didn't love. That was um, always Dory. But otherwise, they really loved it. Something they brought up that I think also made me really realize that this can be a real realized community type of story is that family is important to our main character, but not an obligation. And like knowing that distinction means that the story spent a lot of time on building this community potentially. I don't know. So I'm curious about it. I'm really curious. I think there's also a lot of Chinese influence in the world building. There's a lot of LGBTQ representation. All of these icing on the cake. I, I think I could have a really fun time with it. Now I'm nervous because Bethany DNF'd it because they thought it was overly written and too descriptive, which terrifies me a little bit because those are definitely things I don't like. But if I just pick it up from the library and if I read 50 pages and I'm not feeling it, it's no loss. It's no loss. I don't know. I want this book to work out so well. <laughs> so maybe one day when I'm in my legends and latte mood, I'm going to try it out. All right. This next one, again, was not one I was going to look into. And now I'm curious. I I'm actually really cu curious. And again, it's because of like one review in particular. This is Infinity Gates. Um, by Emmy Carey. And I actually have read one book by him. I read The Girl with All the Gifts, which I did like. I read that book in like two days. Like, I don't think this is going to be as action packed as that. But like, Girl with All the Gifts, if you haven't read it, that's like, that's a page turner. That is such a page turner and really good zombie commentary. But anyways, first in a duology, I will say people have told me this first book ends in a cliffhanger, um, that this is a very good setup book in the duology. It sets the scene. We are learning about how this world is. We're seeing different perspectives. The threads do come together at the end, but then it's not that you get a conclusion. It's more just like, and now we are set up for the other half. So I think when I do read this, I'm going to wait for the second book to be out because I do think this author is big enough that I don't need to like buy this first book and help them out. I, I think their sales will do okay, hopefully. But we do have Rachel Shades of Orange review, Jesse May, who DNF'd it at 50%. Um, we have Books and Bow. That's the review that I'm just like, yeah, now I guess I need this. And then Holly Hart's books. So Jesse May DNF'd this because a thing that happens in the story is you're with a perspective at the beginning and you think, this is my protagonist. This is who I'm following. And then, no, we switch perspectives to a different perspective. I think it's a rabbit girl. And so it's definitely, I don't know if it's like Sea of Tranquility, but it reminded me of the Sea of Tranquility effect of like, we have a lot of different perspectives and I don't know how they're going to intersect. I should probably just trust that they will intersect. And I think that's what Infinity Gate does. But I think potentially then if you really aren't interested in the perspective you switch to, 
that's a detriment. This is a long tome. And so Books and Bao kind of had me hooked by the thematic conversation and the world building parts of it. This was, these were things I wasn't sure if this was going to bring to the table because I've been a little burnt out on multidimensional stuff. I'm not going to lie. I think a lot of people do it really lazily and there's nothing interesting to talk about anymore. But this has me interested about the idea of what happens when a bunch of worlds learn that each of them can do the multidimensional hopping and what they choose to do to govern that situation. And then what do you do when when people don't join in on that situation? That seems to be the tension of the story. And so Books and Bows Review made me cautiously optimistic that this could be like a thoughtful sci-fi that I really enjoy. Like, probably really different from The Girl with All the Gifts, where I think this might be a more introspective, thematic tome of a sci-fi. And the one negative Books and Bow had was that there are sometimes these action scenes that go on way too long, which is a negative for me. And I feel like I, part of that might come from the fact that this author usually writes page turning sci-fi, or at least the one I've read was page turning. So, but I, I can get over that if that were the case. So I'm just really curious about it. Um, so yeah, there's a whole range of thoughts here. Uh, Rachel also had a disconnect with some of the characters. So, and I think that's just the thing when you do multi point of view, it's just kind of what happens. But I think the imaginative qualities of this and the quest, I didn't think I knew it was going to be such like a thoughtful look at this. I thought it would be more just like a blockbuster sci-fi because of the previous work I read and knowing now that it's not really has me interested. But I'm going to wait for the second book and reviews on that before I make a purchase. We're now going to get into some anticipated sequels, starting with the one that I have read, The Faithless by C.L. Clark. I love this. I do have reviews from other people. So we have Tina Sound and Fury, um, Jesse on YouTube, and an interview that Jesse on YouTube did with C.L. Clark, Rachel from the Shades of Orange, and Holly Hart's books. Now, most of the time, if people pick up the sequel, they have already liked the first book. And that is the case, I believe, for most, if not all, these reviewers. Um, and I will say, I think everyone read the first book pretty close to the second book, either as a reread or a first time. I know Holly Hart's books did. I think Rachel did. I'm not sure about Jesse or Tina. And you know, I, I did a reread in January and then picked up The Faithless. And everyone who did that thought it was great to be familiar with the world and the players and the characters and the world building. And all these people generally liked it as much, if not a little bit more than The Unbroken. And I've already talked about on my channel that I don't think it's so different from The Unbroken in any of its execution that if you really didn't get on with the writing style of The Unbroken, this is suddenly going to save it for you. It's still the same writing style. Um, I think maybe some of the pacing's a little different. This is a little slower paced. It's more political. It's, it's more focused on that aspect and less on a rebellion aspect that we had in the previous book. And, you know, we're, we're still having characters figuring out their place in the world, getting some agency. We have some new characters thrown in. We are learning more. But also, if you wanted this to be more magic forward, it's still not magic forward, okay? And we have so many questions for the next book. But like the first book, it does wrap up into a resting point. So it's not like this has a huge cliffhanger. So if you love The Unbroken, I think you're gonna have a great time with The Faithless. If you were looking for more political stuff that we got like in the early parts of The Unbroken, we get a lot of that here. It's really fun. And you know, it's just, it's not overly romantic. It has realistic forms of PTSD representation in some of our main characters because of events in the previous book. It's great. So you know, great book. Check out the other reviewers down below. And then another sequel that I was anticipating, but now not at all. <laughs> this was one that I was very on the fence about, and now I'm, I'm off the fence not getting this book. But this is Assassin of Reality, the sequel to Vita Nostra. Now, I learned on Kalinadi's channel, so Rachel Kalinadi, that this is not the thematic sequel, but a direct sequel to Vita Nostra. So these are translated books by Ukrainian authors. Um, a, husband-wife duo. The husband has passed away recently, unfortunately. And so the trilogy, the Metamorphosis trilogy that has Vita Nostra in it has three books, and the first one was translated. Now, I think I thought the second book in this thematic trilogy was being translated, and I was very interested in that. But actually, they ended up writing a direct sequel to Vita Nostra because it was so popular, and I guess they had more to say. And that is what is translated. And I am significantly less interested in that than I am the thematic pieces. And also, as I was predicting, what they choose to do kind of... I, I have chosen that Vita Nostra is a standalone. I like my interpretation of the ending. I don't like 
where we lead off from the ending based off reviews I've seen. And I'm gonna have to be vague here because it would spoil the end of Vita Nostra to talk about where it goes next. But in case you were wondering, I have Kalinati's channel, I have Rural Reads, who I think really sums up why it probably wouldn't work 100% for me, and then Barkhart Bookshelves, okay? But it's similar to Vita Nostra, but it's half the length and it's oddly not as impactful for a lot of these readers. Like no one straight up regretted reading it, especially since it's only 250 pages. But for me, I, you know, I like my interpretation. I'm just very content and I would rather reread Vita Nostra than read the companion sequel. That's just very much where I'm at. So that's one that was easily off my radar after looking into some research. And the next two I have read and they're the horror releases that I was most excited for. So we have Lone Woman by Victor Laval. So good. So I have reviews from Book Whimsy, Bookish Melody, Mara from Books Like Whoa, Bethany from Beautiful Bookish Bethany, and Literary Life. It's, I mean, I've talked about this book on my channel a lot. And in general, most of these people have very similar opinions to me. I think Literary Life was a little hung up on the historical accuracy of the premise, the most out of everyone. Um, but otherwise, you know, if you go into think of it as a speculative horror that's set in a historical time period and not like a historical fiction, you might get on with that a bit better. But this is something that's just an action-packed, fun ride with really nuanced themes you can choose to unpack or choose to not unpack. And I think I love that that option's there. And it's about single women building and finding a community. And you follow it through the story of Adelaide, who, when you open the story, that cold open is... It is intriguing. The beginning of this book, where you see Adelaide burning down her family farm with her dead parents in it, carrying this trunk to go start a homestead in, I think, Montana, you only have questions. <laughs> and it's really well done. It's really tight. I do think that it's not perfect, per se, but it's really good. And every time I see it at the bookstore, I really want to buy it because I also I really like this cover. And when I think about the richness to it, like while I was reading it, I was very engaged. It surprised me not in the reveals, but when it revealed things if that makes sense. And Victor Laval does this thing where you think you're reading one kind of story and you are until he decides, but I'd rather tell this other story instead. So you're going to have like two stories in one-ish, even though they're all the same story, but tonally it's going to feel a little different. And it works for me, but it definitely won't work for everyone. Like I think you start off more with this like horror at the beginning, but it ends maybe dark, dark fairy tale at the end potentially. And even that's hard to describe, but I think it works. Like I think the story went where the story needed to go. And I could see myself rereading it because it's a story that even though there are reveals, it's not dependent on those reveals being a surprise because you still have to deal with the consequences of the reveals. And I think that's just such masterful stuff. Like uh, I'll read anything by Victor Laval. I need to go into his backlist. So good. Now, something I do want to bring up since it's a horror is if you don't like graphic and gore, you're a very visual reader. There are some scenes that are particularly gory. Not everywhere. So maybe you're someone who can skim through those or maybe you're someone who don't, doesn't have any tolerance. And if that's the case, that's unfortunate because it's so good, but I totally get it. And it, I'm not going to lie and say there aren't descriptive graphic scenes in this book because there definitely are. And the last book we're going to talk about today is House of Good Bones by T. King Fisher. And I, I felt so validated when I looked at reviews for this. So many people thought the same thing as me, and that just always feels good. We have Mara from Books Like Whoa, Pages and Polish, Nerdy Nurse Reads, The Literary Lair, Horror Reads, Bookish Melanie, and Rachel from Shades of Orange. And so not everyone had a fantastic time, but most people agree that this is just like a cozy horror with a lot of campy elements. And that's exactly what I thought when I read this. I'm like, it's a horror. It's really creepy, especially at the end. But I felt so comfortable. I felt so cozy. <laughs> so I'm really validated in that. And Mara has this theory that thematically, like what we're looking at is, you know, you have this progressive liberal millennial going home to visit her mom who's being kind of brainwashed by Fox News. Like it's, it's not quite that. But when this woman goes home, Samantha goes home, her mother is suddenly kind of doing stuff like her grandmother. She's suddenly not acting like herself. And if you've ever had a family member who suddenly changed political ideals on a dime, that's going to be very relevant to you. Now, it evolves from there, and I actually really love the sense of community like I do in every T. Kingfisher. If you like how T. Kingfisher make, gives personalities to animals, that's on full display here. There's a lot of interesting bug facts because our main character is oh, an anthropologist, but specifically for bugs, and I'm forgetting the technical term, but yeah. And also, 
this is a story where you're either going to vibe with the character's internal voice or you're not. And that's where all of the tone comes from. I think she's a gem. I love Samantha. There are lines, and this is Bookish Melody, quoted a line in her review that was like, I said this line out loud to Ryan. It made me laugh so much. <laughs> so, like, it's just you're either going to vibe with it or you're not, I think. Like, you're either going to like hanging out in Sam's head. Or, or you're not. But I think she's really funny. She has a fun head to be stuck in. I think how she processes the weird things that happen around her is part of what makes it both cozy, but you can still be kind of creeped out. Like, there are some things that happen. It's just like, yeah, that's not normal. That's not okay. <laughs> so, yeah, it's a different take on intergenerational trauma. Even people who thought they predicted the ending were surprised by where the ending went. Not necessarily making it, like, a super favorite of all time book for them, but they were surprised that it wasn't as predictable as they thought. So... If that's something you like in your reading experience, that's there. But basically, if you like T. Kingfisher, I think you're going to like this. That's, you know, having read a handful of T. Kingfisher, it's what she does. She does it great. Um, so, yeah, these are all the books that I wanted to talk about for March releases. What were some March releases that you read that you thought were noteworthy that I haven't talked about? What are your opinions on any of these books? Spoiler free. Feel free to leave them in the comments below, especially if you want to be like, Angela, you should read this. Angela, I don't think you'll like this. I will listen and still make my own decisions, but I do love all the feedback. And if you want to leave an emoji to let me know you're here, let's do bones for House of Good Bones. I don't think I've had people do that because I think when I last talked about that book, I did birds or vulture or something. <laughs> and otherwise, like if you liked it, subscribe if you want to, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye. Bye.